Okay, um, and so as it begins to turn, um, 10.50 will begin. So I'm gonna hand over the mic, so to speak, to our dear sister, Bonisile, um, to introduce this topic. Greetings, family. Um, I'm just so enamored by the brilliance of our people to resurrect um, our indigeneity across the board. Um, yesterday's presentation was so powerful. Today, the panelists, I mean, it's just, it's just mind blowing um, the ways in which the work is being done so that we can uh, reconnect with who we truly are. So as uh, Brother Sesa said, I will be uh, facilitating the panel on African medicine. He spoke to it yesterday about how African medicine is um, a house attended uh, a critical part of resurrecting an African science. And it is in such alignment with the themes that have come up and the major theme being, being in alignment with the rhythm of nature. Um, as we look for ways to heal, as we look at our processes of healing, we have to always go back to nature. And so, um, I want to introduce our presenter, Dr. Kwesi Kanandu, who is a scholar, who is a healer. So he can really talk to us about the significance and ways in which Africans approach the concept of medicine. How are we going to heal ourselves, not just physically, but spiritually and, uh, and mentally in all, all parts of ourselves, um, collectively and individually? And how do we determine the prescriptions that we give ourselves for the problems or ailments that we um, come across. So without further ado, I introduce Dr. Kwesi Kanadu. And then again, please don't forget to submit your questions to the Q&A section and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Okay, thank you all very much. Um, all right, so um, greetings, everyone. I'm glad to, I guess I can't see you all, but glad you all are here. So I'm gonna spend 20, 25 minutes, um, you know, addressing this this topic of science and, and medicine and healing. And I'm gonna cycle through a series of sort of questions and um, I'm gonna share my screen at some point to show you some of the medicines that, that are involved in this. And so first and foremost, um, I'm going to route my presentation on African medicine and healing through a specific group of people in West Africa. And those peoples are the Akain peoples who inhabit what is now present day Ghana, but also they bleed into um, Togo um, to the east and Cote d'Ivoire or Ivory Coast to the west, but they're principally in the modern Republic of Ghana. And these Akain peoples, um, it, it are not an ethnic um, term or moniker. A kind refers to first foremost pioneer. So they are roughly what we call first nations. These are people who claim to be indigenous or autochons having claim and become custodians of the particular landscape in which they found themselves in some ancient time. So through these Akan peoples, I hope to offer a, a particular case study for which we can then perhaps have some engagement over. For these Akan peoples, the, the notion of science uh, is captured in this conjoined term referred to as um, but also science is referred to as nindia, that is to know something. Um, and so science involves this particular kind of knowing. So the question before us is, you know, what are the ways of knowing in terms of the approach to medicine and how do healers who are the principal purveyors but not the sole purveyors of medicine, how do they translate those ideas into social uh, and material practice? And so for the Akan peoples, the notion of medicine is referred to as aduru, uh, which is singular, nuru, which is plural. And aduru is really hard to pin down because medicine comes in a, a number of layers. And medicine is, is foremost attached to, but not always attached to the idea of healing, which we refer to as ayarisa, literally to fight disease or to fight illness or to fight uh, that which ails us. 
And so the idea of medicine and healing uh, actually folds into each other because you can't have healing without medicine. You can't have medicine doesn't heal, right? And so there is a um, overlapping correspondence, sort of a tightly braided relationship between medicine and healing. And so between Aduru and Ayarisa, um, we have then this large pharmacopoeia of medicines, large pharmacopoeia of plant medicines. Now, again, there are various kinds of medicines, of course, we can get in the Q&A, but what I wanna zero in on are the plant medicines, that is the medicines that um, come from and come through nature, through human culture, gets its meaning and its application. And so I wanna share with you, and I hope I can um, share my screen. I wanna share with you just a few images, and then we'll, we'll come back to some of these um, guiding questions that I have for you all. And so um, this is a, a, a close friend um, and, and colleague, um, Kofi Sechi. Uh, much of my work is not in Ghana broadly. It's mostly in Asante mine or the Asante region, or it's in Techi mine, which is my primary region. So Techi mine, for those of you that are curious, it is about six hours northwest of Accra, the capital, about two hours northwest of Kumasi. Um, and so this um, colleague of mine, um, Kofi Sechi, uh, is in the compound area of the late Anna Kofi Donko, his father, and who was a prominent healer in the Techiman region. In fact, I can share with you um, in the chat later, the, the most recent book of mine is about this healer Kofi Donko and his community and his family and the nation that became Ghana. For now, what Kofi Sechi is doing is, is, the, is the practice of medicine, that is, there are plants, various plants that have, have been crushed into this particular composite. And that composite, of course, um, you know, uses um, a, a locally made gin called Casa Preco. And that gin, of course, is mainly a lubricant for getting the essential um, out of these, these plants uh, as they are mashed and pounded and grounded. Eventually, that medicine will be attached to, as you see in a moment, um, the kashiri, which is the pad that the healers refer to as obusunfo, used to carry this brass pen for which they use to prophesize in, in, I guess, in English parlance, to divine and to essentially access knowledge that are only accessible in the world of ancestry and the world of these spiritual forces, which we call abusum. And so the medicine, again, is aduru is tied to ayarisa, that is illness and disease, but it's also tied to acts of divination or accessing these deep knowledges uh, from ancient times um, among the Atiti four or the ancient ones. And so um, this, this particular um, image here is, and let me kind of lower this down. This particular image here is of course, it bleeds into the next one. This is the preparation of the cache. Um, I won't go into much detail because this is actually a sacred process, but I want to share with you that how the medicines are transformed into these um, properties that are that are then essentially escorted from nature and put into the human world of culture. And then of course, put to spiritual, psychological, as well as uh, material and physical use. And so you'll notice that lump of medicine I shared with you before is right here. And those medicines, of course, come from nature more broadly. Um, but that nature, of course, has a range of plant medicines for which we, ch which we choose from. And the key part of my learning um, in becoming a healer, becoming a Busunfu, was in fact spending a lot of time in nature, listening, observing, um, following, as well as curating you know, the knowledge that I had to gain in terms of identifying what plants, what part of the plant is it the leaf, are the flowers, is it the root, is it the stem? And which part does what in combination or in isolation? And so these are part of the curriculum you know, for the healers. And for those of you that are interested further, uh, one of my favorite books I think is appropriate here to share with you, uh, if you haven't you know, digested this yet, is The Healers. The, name, the book is called The Healers by Ayikwe Amar. Uh, that book is excellent when it comes to some of the final points that I'm referring to here. This is yours truly, many years ago. <laughs> Um, during, during my um, quote unquote training uh, in Techiman, um, I trained about five to seven years. And this is a ceremony called Kunkuma. Um, this is sort of pre-graduation. Um, a healer's never finished learning, but there's but there's a preparatory period. And the person you can see um, to my uh, right um, is Nana Yamensa, who has since passed away. He was one of my principal teachers um, during this period. And many of those, those children in the background, by the way, are adults right now. So this is some time ago, but 
this is part of that that process where there are medicines around my wrist and so these are sumain um that are sacred beads but they're also their medicines this raffia the medicines tied within them and so literally the healer has to be immersed and and bathe in medicine in a moment i share with you some of the photos from literally bathing in medicine seven times a day um, for over a quite long period of time um, what i was surprised to see is that a number of these medicines and plants um, they have a diasporic you know um, traction or history to them so what you see in front of you um, if you're from Jamaica, you'll be familiar. This is aki. In tree, it's called achi. So aki, we prepare this as a food, but it's but it's used um, sometimes locally as 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 a medicine. That is the the plant itself and the leaves are used rather than the actual fruit. So the the orange, reddish orange, you know, fruit in Jamaica, we use it as a food. In fact, it's part of the national dish, aki and selfish. Uh, but in Techiman, they don't eat the fruit, but they use the plant itself for medicine preparation. And these Aki trees, they are part of a larger brand of foods that migrated from the Caribbean basin among enslaved Africans um, in the 19th century back to the then Gold Coast, which is now present day Ghana. And so there's a range of fruits and, and medicine plants that made this transatlantic circuit. Um, these are other plants, you know, that was part of my training. And so you can't see him, he's obscure, but that's um, Kofi Sechi to the left. And we're, and we're basically, we're, we're going through plant identification, um, learning, you know, what shapes, sizes, and feel of the leaves, how to identify them. Um, because as you probably can imagine, there's, there's a range of iterations of medicines and identify them with, with precision takes a lot of practice, a lot of training. And so this is part of um, the curriculum a, a, as it were. Um, this too. And so here, um, you know, part of the process of identifying is also essentially spending time um, to, to, to listen to um, the, the, the medicines. And this is a part of the um, process that you will get when you read the book called The Healers, if you haven't read it already. And these are other trees. And I want to bring to you here is that notice that the leaves in front of you, they're, they're of different kinds. So even there are overlapping trees and leaves, even on the same tree, you may have different leaves. And so again, the, the precision which one has to um, ground themselves with identifying the leaves are crucial to how then these plant medicines are used. And this is a bath. So what you see here is a plant called Anyamijia. Um, and this is a long story, which of course we can talk about in the Q&A, but the Yamin tree is a very important sacred tree. And this particular tree um, has a three or four prong. And what's sitting between this tree is this, is this large um, you know, um, cauldron that is filled with plant medicines. And, and each day uh, in, in this particular location, I would bathe seven times a day um, for three, four, five months um, straight on, because literally the healer has to sit and bathe with the medicine. Literally, he or she has to become medicine. Um, and that force to which the healer has, the spiritual force, is attracted to the magnetic field created by being bathing medicine. And so therefore the healer is medicine incarnate, and that allows the healer to be able to not only see disease and, and, and heal, but also to um, essentially connect his or her spirit with the spirit of the patient so as to facilitate the healing on multiple uh, registers because this is a holistic approach to medicine and healing. Um, these are more medicines by the river. Um, and, and this is named after um, a horse, which in Chi we call Ponko. So this is Ponko in Su, literally the horse by the river. And so this is one way we identify this particular plant because it's usually found by, by rivers and streams. And this is me, of course, <laughs> uh, handling some of these medicines and taking them back uh, as a matter of sampling. More medicines here um, that, that, that flow. And I'm gonna stop the share here uh, and come back to the full screen. And so medicine is referred to as aduro, uh, healing as yarisa. Um, and these plant medicines, uh, again, play a crucial role in the healing process uh, precisely because the, each plant has a rhythm, has a frequency, has an energy. And knowing the frequency energy allows you to essentially syncopate, that is to align the energy with the particular physical, spiritual, or psychosomatic ailment 
um, of the patient or even the community because there's an idea of social medicine that when there's discord, when there is disharmony among families and among community members, um, healing takes on a much wider scope and scale, right? Um, and so the primary tools used in healing are several. Um, we use um, vapor therapy, whereby we would uh, have a, a series of medicines um, or the extraction of medicines, um, and they would actually um, put in a large cauldron of sorts and the steam from it, um, the patient would uh, essentially inhale it. So there's a vapor steam therapy. Of course, there's bathing, which is very common, whereby we prepare a series of medicines, roots, barks, leaves, um, and then we prepare it as a medicinal bath where we would instruct the, um, the patient um, to bathe in a particular way for a number of days. And then of course, to have his or her write down their dreams and share it with the healer so that he or she can assess the, um, the workability of the medicines or to change the medicines to hit whatever frequencies that we see through the dreams and through having this dialogue with the patient. Tools also include uh, incisions. Um, they include using a um, generic medicine called muto, which is sort of a, a medicine that has been burnt into a black powdered form. And that black powder form, uh, muto, is then used, it's added to food, it's added to, uh, in this case in the US, it's added to Florida water, it is added to a range of preparations. Uh, so, it's, so it's like a, a first aid kit of source that's used uh, for a number of, of, of first aid-like um, situations. There's also the the use of the these um, in our case um, these brass pans called yawa that are carried on the head uh, of the busumfo and through that the busumfo is able to uh, which are typically which are male um, they are able to access um, insights into the broader context and even the historical or family lineage context of the patient because healing of course is not only uh, horizontal, meaning it affects the broad community, it's also vertical, that it affects also this deep lineage of ancestry. And so we have to sort of have this, this, this dual approach that is horizontal and vertical plane um, to get the sort of holistic uh, approach to health and healing. And there are much more we can talk about in the Q&A. Um, you know, and then we think about, you know, how do African people, particularly these Akan people, uh, um, how um, do they view a person who needs to be healed? Um, well, one of the primary, you know, uh, ways in which we detect illness is conflict, right? Conflict clarifies, like COVID, right? COVID exposes, you know, this facade of a world that's been presented to us for what it is. Um, conflict does the same. It exposes, it, 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 it draws attention to what needs to be addressed or healed, right? And so when there, whenever there's social discord, marital discord, interpersonal discord, sibling discord, um, societal conflict, you know, uh, gossiping, you know, those kinds of uh, um, symptomatic functions, that's when healing is, is needed, right? Um, no one needs to be healed in harmony, but I will say this, that healing is, is necessary in harmony to maintain the harmony, right? So there's still work to be done even when there is some semblance of assured healness. And so the primary focus, therefore, is not the physical, though the physical is a part of it, but the physical is a vehicle to get at the non-physical, right? Um, you know, our view is not from the French philosopher Rene Descartes. So it is not a Cartesian view of mind and body and we stop there or it's reason and, and body. Um, but that spirit, you know, that is intuitiveness. And by the way, scientists have recently recognized that intuition is a higher form of intelligence. So that intuition, you know, that gut feeling, that feeling you have in your stomach when something's just not right, that, that burning feeling you have in your ears or your head, those are all markers of your own self-healing capacity and ability that we all have, whether you are a official healer or not. Um, and therefore, it marks out that our approach to health and healing is never, nor should it be, relegated to just the physical, right? I mean, in other words, taking a few Advil and Tylenol is not going to do it. Right. Even though those might provide urgent care relief for certain, you know, physiological pains, that's not healing. And, and of course, we can talk about the difference between healing and urgent care. And so um, it's also true that focusing on the spiritual part solely is also incomplete. Right. In the sense that 
we're not just spiritual beings. We're spiritual beings in a human experience, right? In a human body. And so we have to therefore tackle um, all these layers of us packaged into these persons that we called ourselves um, at the same time. We have to ask, basically have this multi-pronged approach at the same time without a disregard to either. That is harmonizing them rather than seeing them as odd couples. And so the illness, which we refer to as yare or yadie, um, you know, the illness of course is, is really a function of conflict of discord of disharmony and um you know once that illness you know is 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 recognized and sometimes not recognized because we know that human beings hold things to themselves and so by the time it's recognized think of it this way by the time it's recognized think of it as how we how we think about you know thirst right by the time we're thirsty Thirst is not the source. Thirst is a symptom of dehydration, right? So by the time we recognize, you know, that illness is upon us, you know, what we see is the thirst, right? And we think, well, all we need is water. But by that point, it's not the thirst because thirst is simply a symptom of the dehydration, which is the source, right, of the thirst and the need for water. And so by the time we usually get to um, and we see the symptoms, they're often symptoms of a root or root causes that require, again, a multi-pronged approach within the toolkits of healers. And so spirituality um, and healing, um, you know, these are tightly braided um, functions. They can't be separated, nor should they be, as you find in a hospital um, setting in most cases. Um, they have to take into account the person's um, ecology, their family history, their own personal challenges and assets, um, the context in which they live, you know, all the in a rural area, forest area, savanna area, those things matter in the full range of um, approaching medicine and healing. And so um, if we think about how we, we know medicine and the techniques, you know, discovered by healers, much of these techniques are owed to the Ateti four, that is these ancients. And what they use was basic empiricism. They noticed that for instance, certain animals, we eat certain plants. And that, certain, and, and that they would observe the effect of those plants on those animals. In other words, um, you know, rather than use human beings as you know, a sort of a, um, a trial, <laughs> right? Um, trial stage of developing you know, certain kinds of pharmaceuticals, what these ancients did was essentially use nature. They would observe you know, the, the foliage. They would observe you know, when certain plants would bend or lean, or they would observe how durable and resilient a plant was, or they would observe how certain animals would choose certain plants to consume or stay away from, right? And from that deep empiricism over time, they develop essentially coded wisdom, right? A set of knowledges, right? Nimdie, a set of knowledges that were then translated into social practice. And of course, there was experimentation because that's what science involves. And so um, for the Akan people living in a deep deciduous forest, that involved um, deep wrestling with malaria wrestling with yellow fever, wrestling with other, you know, sort of natural maladies. And therefore they had to think about, okay, what are the plant resources in their environment? And that's where spirituality comes in because many of the earlier calm peoples settled by riverbanks, settled um, their communities um, by rivers and streams. And in doing so, they were able to encounter and confront these spiritual forces. I have a, a yain uh, as one of my favorite. These 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 song played on the these played on the atumpine drum, and it captures what I'm saying saying here uh, in this moment. And it goes something like this: Asutra kwain, akwain trasu, Asutra kwain, akwain trasu, upehini wain. The river crosses the path. The path crosses the river. Which is the elder, or which came first? Right. That's the riddle. Which came first, the path or the river? And then the answer is 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 in the sort of the next line, next stanza, which is Yeboki Yeboki Aquain Kutu Suno, Yebodi Aquain Kusuno, O Sufri Tete, O Sufri Duman Kuma Badi, O Pitanunsu, and so on and so forth. That is, it was we that encountered the river, right? Um, and so we it's we that created the path to encounter the river, which means the river was first. And the river they're referring to is Tano, that is the most sacred river in a Khan spiritual life. And that river, um, of course, is the home of all uh, water-derived obusumo spiritual forces that pervade the entire landscape. So I'm a busum for, for two Tano busum, Takofi Brempong and Takwabinabina. And Ta is the contraction for Tano. And so you'll find these all throughout Ghana. You find Takofi Takwabina on the coast, 
in the forest, at the edge of the forest savannah region. And it is through these spiritual forces that these ancestors were able to gain insight into nature, into the workings, guided them through their dreams and through consultation with these Babasum to the appropriate medicines that essentially layered their empirical coded wisdom developed over centuries. And so healers are specialists, but they're not the only ones. So I found that, you know, most young people, by young, I mean 12 to 20 years old, they knew at least 20, 25 medicinal plants and their uses off the top of their head. But healers specialize, right? They're specialists. And so when family and, and sort of, um, you know, narrow kinds of knowledge, by narrow, I mean con confined to a small group of people, when that knowledge is sufficient, then they go to the specialists, right? And so, um, healing, kind of bringing this to a close and keeping to my 20 minute, 25 minute time. Um, there, finally, therefore, when we think about, you know, how do we go about implementing, you know, these indigenous forms of medicine and healing for African people in our current time and space, then um, it's really not a question of how, but it's really a question, I think, of what and then how. By the what I mean, um, we, I'm suggesting that we, um, do two things. We think broadly about general African approaches, Africa-based approaches to medicine and healing, and then root ourselves in a specific form that gives you a specific approach that that gels with your spirit, that gels with with you know what you can tell or detect about who you are, because it is that coherence between the specificity of what gels with you, uh, while having a broad sort of pan-Africanist you know um, framework to work with that I think will help with the specificity because you and I both feel pain and hurt, but we feel it differently. We, we interpret it and, and you know, work through it differently. And it, it is that nuance that why you know, I don't suggest some broad sort of generic uh, homogenized approach, but that is broad framework, specific um, mechanism to get to um, that particular technique or approach in this moment. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dr. Kanadu. That was amazing. Um, and I think you ended on a really beautiful note, just really around the idea of what resonates, right? And taking, taking a holistic approach when trying to figure out what prescription works for who, right? Looking at the family, looking at the lineage, looking at the environment. Um, and what resonates with that energy, what plant energy resonates with the energy of those that need to be healed, I think is extremely critical. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, so we have some questions that have been coming into the chat. Um, if possible, if folks have more questions, please submit them in the Q&A. Uh, I'm gonna start off with this question. First question um, from uh, Brother Kahari. Um, the question is, there is a growing tendency to take healing modalities from different cultures of the world, whether it's acupuncture, Reiki, yoga, and map African, African values and principles to them retroactively. Are there indigenous traditions that focus on the physical in that way, so that for these kinds of physical ailments, we're not outsourcing to other cultures and traditions? That's a great question, great question. Um, folks, um, I'm gonna to put to the panelists and attendees there's a link to the book. Um, it, it, it has a lot in there because it focuses on this 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 wonderful uh, and great healer from Techiman. Uh, and I think it will answer some of the other questions that we don't have time for um, um, today. And by the way, folks can always reach out to me. Um, I also leave my, my email um, and, and the like if you like. So to the question, which is a great question. Um, I don't think that there is a a conflict recognizing, for example, that there is something of value in, let's say, Tai Chi, you know, which I did when I was younger, or in, you know, some other form. Um, but I think the heart of the question, if I, if I get the heart of the question is, you know, what are sort of the African iterations of that, you know, of those, and, and there are. So for example, um, you know, among the Akan people, and, and there's a subgroup called the Buno peoples that I know in Techiman, you know, the best, um, they meditate, right? Who would have thought that? It, 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 there's a way, in fact, healers like myself, Busumfo, we don't go into so-called trance, it's actually a meditation. And um, there are no drums, there are simply just words, invocation. 
and the person who says that is the uh, Ochiami, and 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 they'll and and and, and, they'll, and they'll make this invocation, um, and you just sit there, and you breathe, and you carry the pan in your head, and so and 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 after you know maybe a minute or two, um, you know you begin to feel this energy, the force, at least for me, around my head, right, like a headband, and then then it rushes through my body. Um, and then it hits my toes and it comes back up and sort of comes full circuit. So there's actually, there's actually a meditative portion to this. Also for non-healers, they can't have a calendar called the Adagio 9 of 42 days. And on that calendar, each person has a, uh, a krada, that is the day in which your soul came to this earth. So I am Kwesi because my soul came to earth on a Sunday, but a specific Sunday. So each, each sort of month on the Adagio, uh, Adagio 9 cycle of 42 days, I'm born on a particular Sunday. So I'm born on Munukwesi, which is a fresh Sunday, right? And on that day, I'm supposed to, you know, following the ancients, do certain rituals, including wearing white, abstaining from fufu and meats, abstaining from sexual intercourse, if you're an adult, um, you know, wearing shitty, which is this clay retrieved from sacred rivers and streams and going by the sacred river and stream or sacred place could correspond to your, um, your, the spirit of your mother's family, the Abusia, and the spirit of the father or the Inturo, and meditating on your purpose in life. And you take a bath. And the goal of that bath, you all, is to remember your negotiated purpose in life that you had with this creative force called variously Onyankopong, Chidempong, Udumankuma, and so on. Because the Akan believed that you basically had this meeting, right, with this creative force. And you say, hey, in this lifetime, I want to do this. And the creator said, okay, but I also want to do this. So by doing this ritual every 42 days, it's a ritual of remembrance, but it's based on meditation and it's so beautiful. It's just you and nature sitting there every 42 days in this. So I dig yoga, I, I dig meditation, you know, from, from, from Buddhism. But what I'm suggesting is that we have these forms and techniques that are perhaps more ancient, if you read the historiography, and that are, that are I think, equally, if not more effective. And of course, I could share more if you'd like, but I, I'll leave it there. No, that's that's truly amazing. And I think uh, the brother who was speaking yesterday was talking about how these ways of knowing and ways of engaging with spirit are fundamentally the same, but it's about the intention, mm -hmm. right? It's about um, why and the intention behind how we are engaging in these practices. So I know that there's, you know, in the conscious community, right? Um, there's like comedic yoga, right? And um, the way that we have brought that to ourselves and about ourselves, we still are using the yoga practice that is from, you know, in the ancient India, but we, we can still find what resonates with our spirit as African people. Um, and it's still um, a healing modality for folks who believe in it and engage in it. So thank you for that. So another question um, that came up which is really interesting when we're looking at uh, the way that um, modern society looks at herbalism and healing. So this question is from uh, Leilani Gill. If foods and herbs are mass produced um, with not the best energy or intentions put into it, do they still have the same effect on us? Um, can it become negative depending on how it was actually produced or cultivated? That's an excellent question. Well, these folks are on it this morning, <laughs> they're sharp. I uh, appreciate that. Well, first, I think we have to distinguish between food and edible substances. And so a chicken does not grow in six weeks. <laughs> a watermelon should not be that big, right? <laughs> and so uh, what we have essentially are these edible substances that we find in supermarkets, uh, even Whole Foods, right? So don't, don't be fooled by that. Um, and Trader Joe's and these other spaces, right? And then, of course, we have nutritious organic foods. And so, um, the question is in terms of our location. So for those of us, for example, who are in the South, Maryland, I guess, from down to Florida and Texas, um, and if you have access to land, even small land, uh, it, it is to grow the, the most essential of herbs, right? Of spices. Uh, you may not be able to grow yams because it, it may not be, it's not the environment for that unless you're in Florida, for example. But you, you, can't, you can't grow root crops per se, but you can grow many of the spices and herbs you have in your apartments. I'm here in New York City. Uh, we have a, a backyard and a, and, a, and a sort of small farm in the back. So the key is, is to try to mitigate 
you know, because we are in we are in the environment of 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 of, of the non food, right? <laughs> we are in the space of the non food of the edible substances, and so the the key, you know, as sort of a bridge strategy until we can get to a space, you know, where where uh, folks control for the most part what they grow, where they grow it, and and that as I see in the question that their seeds, you know, are not you know solely coming from Monsanto's and these, and these monopolizers of seeds. And so the key is for those in the city urban areas, you have, um, you can grow sprouts in your apartment window. You can grow a number of things inside your apartment. Yes, I'm in Brooklyn too. <laughs> um, and, and, and so people have been growing on rooftops, right? My daughters and I have been using hydroponics, right, in our house. So I'm saying there's a number of creative ways, you know, I'm growing seeds, you know, here, um, and then I put them in the back, you know, I transfer them. And so there's a number of creative ways that folks can begin to, I think, mitigate the, the, the sort of net cost of these edible substances that are fronting as food, right? <laughs> um, and that have this net negative effect on our health. So you're right, the medicines and the plants, you know, that are, that are steeped in these fertilizers, steeped in these chemicals, they do essentially transfer that energy to us if we use them. And so um, the ways to get around that, if you can't grow, is to import. So I, 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 get, I get medicines from Ghana. Uh, I'm, from, I'm born in Jamaica, so I go back to Yad and, and you know, I get medicines from, from Jamaica. I, get, I order medicines you know, through Epsi and other sites, right, from Brazil. So there's ways I think to, to strategically get around it as a bridge strategy until we can get the place in the space to really grow our own. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have about four more minutes. Um, and so I'm gonna ask another question. This question is from uh, Brother Amoa. He said, how is the ability to hear the uses of plants? And I'm sorry, how is the ability to hear the uses of plants and understand and cultivate them? So to be able to sit with the plants and really hear them and to connect with them and be in relationship with them, how is that understood and cultivated within the Akan um, culture? Well, within the, broad, within the broad cultures of these Akan peoples, um, again, th there are sort of peripheral knowledge that one gets from just being in the environment, right? Um, but then there are the specialists. So the Akumfo or Busumfo or the Adunsini, which is the sort of the particular specific herbalists, um, they have to literally sit in and sit with medicine. And so beyond the bathing and the, and, and the rituals that I mentioned a moment ago um, during the presentation, um, by hearing, I mean this. We all have ears, but we don't hear it the same way. And so literally as, as a healer in my training, I literally had to put medicine on my ears, literally. I'm put, I had to put medicines, for example, and I'll show you how it works, yeah. so. Um, there are these plants that I would squeeze the juices out of and they would essentially drop like drops. That's another therapy, by the way. We use eye drops too. There are certain plants we use as eye drops or there are plants that we crush into a fine powder, add water to it, right? And create its own and put it in a small droplet and create our own eye drop. So literally I put medicine on my ears, on my eyes, right? So when I go to divine, whether through the Asuya or you know, I'm going to carry the pan, I'll put medicine in my eyes and on my ears. And I will, I will hear, I will hear things, right? And for, for those of you that are non-healers, um, and I don't mean that in any class way, um, just to be clear, a major portal for our knowledge and access to medicines and hearing is our dreams. And I'm a big proponent of having a dream journal, write every dream down, you see patterns, you see things because my ancestors speak to me in my dreams. They'll praise me, they'll admonish me. <laughs> they say, hey, you gotta do better than that, right? And so, I mean, they keep it real as they should, you know? Um, they're honest with me and I'm honest with them. And so, um, again, we have so much self-healing power in therapy, including hearing. And I think that cultivating that with your ancestry, with your dreams is a great way. And that's what I mean by the specificity because your lineage is not my lineage. We can walk the same road, but we can't, we can't take the same steps. And I'll leave it there in inches of time. <laughs> so Kat, we actually do have a little bit more time since the last session okay. went over a little bit. So if we have more questions, people can add more questions in the chat. So we do have a little bit more time. So yeah, don't feel no pressure about that. 
Great. Um, yeah, I actually see a question on here that um, I think would be really interesting for you to answer. So um, this is from Afro Navy. And essentially the question that they're asking is just about the connections between the cultures of the diaspora. So they said, how have you investigated the Afro-Caribbean context for the remnants slash retention of the Akan healing culture? So have you seen that in Jamaica? Have you seen that in other Caribbean cultures? Have you seen that here in the Americas where we have retained some of these West African healing cultures? Um, and in what ways have you seen that? Oh, um, that question is already answered. I'm gonna put the, I'm gonna put the, there's a link I just put in the chat. Uh, I have a book called The Akan Pioneers. It was formerly the second edition. The first edition was called The Akan Diaspora in the Americas. So I take, I, take you, I take you all from West Africa context, and then I go to Barbados, Jamaica, Antigua, um, formerly the, the um, Danish Caribbean, what was formerly St. John, St. Croix, and um, I think I'm missing on that, St. Thomas, excuse me, which is down the US Virgin Islands. I take you to Brazil. I take you to um, what is now Guyana, formerly the Dutch colonies of Escriabo, Demerara, and Barbies. Uh, I take you to French Guinea. I take you to the US, to Georgia, to, to, to Maryland, to New York, uh, to Boston, um, to the Carolinas, you know, and I, I, I try to dig out these experiences with these Akan peoples. And so um, that work has been done. So I would suggest um, in interest of time and getting some other questions that that work has been done at least for the Akan peoples. And then of course, I have another book called Transatlantic Africa that folks can find more information on my site at kwesikunadu.info, uh, which I think I put in the chat early on um, that is more broader. So this is about African people's broader in terms of um, their you know, narrative. And what I did there was uh, um, reading these multilingual sources, um, French, German, um, I don't read Arabic, I read French, I say some of the Arabic, um, you know, um, indigenous languages and, and other European languages to basically do something that hasn't been done before, which was tell the story of transatlantic and trans, in, transatlantic and Indian Ocean slaving from the perspective of the people who experienced it, from the Africans, and from their narratives. So I found a lot of accounts, uh, over 12 dozen accounts in Africa, outside in the African world, that I was able to write it. So check out the second edition of Transatlantic Africa, um, because, and you won't be disappointed. And what I focused on was on family, on community, the things that mattered most to these people. I don't focus on, on ship size and weight, what goods were shipped from here to there. I focus on the people and their stories. And I was blown away that the first thing most people talked about in their accounts was about their families. And that resonates, I think, with folks here in the US, for example, because you know, during that fiction called the Emancipation Proclamation, what I found remarkable was not that proclamation or, or what does it purport to mean, was that most formerly you know, enslaved Africans as chattel were looking for their families along dirt road, along back alleys, along these strips uh, of mud and swamp. That's what they were doing in unison without realizing it, looking for the last known recollection or news about their loved ones. And to me, that's where the power lies. That's powerful, wow. I mean, yep. Uh, the, the folks of Eero, they, they always say that family is the first shrine. You know, so when you're looking for that healing, go to go to your family and your lineage. Um, okay, another question. Uh, this is from Emmanuel. He said, "Are there any Ashanti or Akan medical practices that have influenced specifically modern medicine, or have provided solutions to treating diseases that are unknown?" Oh yes. In fact, there's a, there's a book I refer to you all. I put it in the chat. Um, there's a book called Bitter Roots. Um, it's by a colleague of mine. She's at Texas. She's a historian, medical historian. Um, it's called Bitter Roots, and it focuses on the the um, focuses on biopiracy, right? That is taking indigenous know-how and knowledge about plant medicine and healing, and then of course, you know, recoding it into the pharmaceutical industry and profiting off of it. And it, it's really a, a really a remarkable story that I think a lot of folks are not aware. Of. So we know about medical apartheid, right, and, and those kinds of um, you know violence, you know, predatory violence through the provision provision of medicine. Um, Thank you, yeah, yeah. Um, but Bitter Roots is one example of how directly Akan medicines or Akan 
intuitive medicines and plants uh, that have been coded wisdom over centuries have been used uh, and still continue to be used by the way. So, you know, Glaxo Klein Smith, Eli Lilly, when they're pocketing these billions, right? It is from these medicines and plants, right? It's not just for the, for example, I mean, we all know, for example, like, you know, Cialis and Viagra, they come from African medicines, right? And so, um, you know, th th there is that, you know, um, interplay that, 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 that is there. And I think Bitter Roots, that book will at least introduce folks who are not familiar with it, you know, to that particular um, plundering. Great. Okay, so the last question I will ask in the interest of time is, can you just speak about the various types of illnesses and sicknesses that the Akan recognized? This question comes from Brother Quase, sorry, Brother Sesa. Oh, <laughs> there are thousands. In fact, Kofi Donko, who I write about in our own way in this part of the world, um, his knowledge, by the way, was also, um, uh, was also, um, stolen and, and, and profited from um, this anthropologist named Dennis Warren. Dennis Warren got his um, doctorate, got acclamation, became a World Bank expert from the knowledge of Kofi Donko. Kofi Donko had found over 2,000 degrees lexemate at a degree term, at terms for diseases and illnesses. And so some of them overlap, of course, right? Um, but many of them, you know, they, they speak to sort of the specificities. These are, these are essentially diseases that have been sort of cataloged over his 40 or 60 year career as a healer. And so many of them will, will, will be almost moot. Some of them will overlap if you look at them closely, but for the most part, they're a catalog of that. So there are at least thousands, um, because again, you know, our, the ways our bodies work in our in ecologies outside of it, uh, and the ways in which our spirit acclimate to or reject, you know, you know, these movements, you know, of our bodies um, through space and time, they, they have an effect, you know, on those three layers of our being, you know, our spiritual being, our physical being, of course, our cognitive, you know, being. But there, but there are plenty. There, there are hundreds of thousands of diseases. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank, thank you for that. I think Barbara. we actually we still have a couple of more minutes. Um, like I said, the, the, the time shifted. So I know a few, someone asked a question about um, the medical corps and the Ashanti military. So if you can speak, if you know anything about that prior to colonization, kind of just medicine in the context of war, I guess. Um, oh, well, I'm not sure about what the person means by medical corps. Um, but I, I probably don't have time to clarify that. I'm not sure what it means by that, but uh, I will you know, refer to, and I'll put it in the chat. Um, there's a there was a there's an older article um, that came out some years ago about Asante medicine in the 19th century, and it, it, it's worth it's worth the worth the read. And I'm gonna, I'm going to put it, the link for it uh, in in the chat for for those of you that are interested. And yeah, it's about 19th century Asante medical practices, which I think is fascinating. Um, but unless you're in the academic role, you probably are not aware of it. So here's the link to the JSTOR article. Um, if anyone has problems accessing it, just, just contact me and I'll send you the PDF. Great. Okay. And um, then there was one more question too okay. um, from a sister. It was a question about holding space. She said, um, the concept of holding space versus observation, is that a concept within the Akan healing practices? So how I know of holding space is like leaving space for the vulnerabilities to come through um and providing that space for folks to heal so is that a concept within the african sciences or within um a con culture or how does that relate to observation okay um tell me again rephrase for me what's meant by holding space so holding space how i know it and I, and she can clarify in the chat um holding space you know it's a term that um a lot of circles will have to say, I'm gonna hold space for you so you can be vulnerable, so you oh. can kind of release what you need um, without without any intervention. You're just kind of giving space and being there as a support system for someone to allow for their uh, vulnerabilities to to become present. Okay, Sister Bonacile, thank you very much. That, that, that translation was effective, I get, I get it now. Uh, so yes, yeah, they are. Um, I, I've seen folks use what's called an ash circle where um, you know they'll have the, the two 
folks in conflict sort of sit, you know, back to each other, and um, they'll they'll put an ash or shitty, which is a, this 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 pot around them, and in that space they can say whatever they want, but they're not to each other, right? Because the key is for them to get out what they're holding in. In fact, there's a festival in, in around, no, yeah, around this time in, in Techimon called the Apo Festival. Apo is from the verb po, which means to reject, to release. And in that festival, which is about two, three days sometimes, you know, people will speak their mind, even to people in a power and authority. The idea is, the, the premise is that if you release and get out of you that which ails you, that which, you know, um, you know, turns your insides, you know, into knots, that which, you know, essentially threatens your own, you know, balance and equilibrium, getting it out, and in, in, again, in a space, and this is a public space, so I'm telling you, thousands of people do a poll. So this is a community form of what you're referring to, but there's also what the individuated form, the couples form, where they'll do the ass circle. Um, there's also the form where many healers will hold um, sort of council where the, the grief party will come and they'll come to the busumfie or the so-called shrine house. And they may say, hey, you know, wife and I have been you know, arguing um, or, or this happened. And the healer then is more of a counselor and consoler and, and reconciliation, right? Um, for the benefit of the community. And so part of that process is, of course, acknowledging to your question that this is a safe space for you to bleed. That's beautiful. And someone put in the chat, you know, that women will also hold space for other women during a birth. Exactly. Um, which I and in the Econ context, very quickly, the men are not allowed in that space. <laughs> <laughs> including the father, including the father. Wow, that's powerful. Uh, see, Saul, what are we looking like on time? So, I mean, we can begin wrapping up over the next um, five or so minutes. Um, I think the brother came back and clarified about the military question. So basically military personnel being trained to treat soldiers in the midst of battle. So kind of what's the context, I guess, of the healer in the context of battle and how are, you know, the Af African medicine applied to that? Right. Um... I'm a historian, so I, I base what well, I guess what I know on, on um, the evidence, the records, and so um, certainly healers did go to fight to war. In fact, many of them that went to fight to war were exported during the transatlantic slaving era, right? That's why we find them in Jamaica, we find them in you know in Guyana, we find them in the South um, because they were part of the, the crop that were that were exported precisely because healers would in fact go on the front lines. Um, as, as it were. Um, so uh, without a doubt, you know, that, 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 that was certainly the case. Um, and, but yeah, there were many personnels, um, they were bone setters, you know, you know, there were people, you know, that, that were there to apply medicines. Um, and and also, to re also to recognize that many of the people who are fighting these wars are not professional soldiers, which means that they already have a grasp of what plants or what things to use themselves. And so these are people that have essentially sort of a, a generic but broad enough knowledge for, for some kind of self-healing, then you have specialists who are also there as well. Great. Um, Madasi, Yo. powerful presentation. Thank you for answering all of these questions so thoroughly. Um, I've learned a lot. I know everyone else here has as well. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Cesar. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Chrissy Konadu. I, I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Very, very informative. Um, so our next presentation actually has been pushed back a little bit to 12. Um, so we're gonna take a small break. So if you, you know, you wanna sit here, you can. If you wanna go run and do something and come right back, that's also, you know, okay. But we will come back around, um, let's say uh, 1155. And then we'll be beginning the next presentation. And that presentation is on the African mind. So thank you. <laughs> 